Andy, tell about the wheelbarrow. The wheelbarrow. Oh, yeah, this was in the news. Many of you may have seen this lately. Some fellow, I don't know where he was at, but uh, he got his tax bill. I don't know if it was for the tags of his car because he bought a new car. Is that what it was? So he went to the bank. The tax was like $3,000. And so he went to the bank, or several banks actually, and got $3,000 in pennies. <laughs> he hired 11 people to come and take them out of the wrappers, and he put them in a half a dozen wheelbarrows. <laughs> Rolled them into the, to the place where they were to charge him the fee, and rolled his barrels up there and watched while they counted every day. <laughs> I love that. That's called revenge. You know? That's right. That's right. And somebody asked him after it was all over and he was carting his wheelbarrows back out to the truck, do you regret doing that? He said, it was worth every penny. talking about going back to ground zero while you are getting your study guide let me make some statements to you that you can see when you get your copy I want to start out by reading the scripture to you it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9 it says for we are laborers together with God you are God's husbandry. That word husbandry is translated from the Greek language tillage or ground or garden or vineyard. That means that we are in partnership with God. We are laborers together with God. That means that we are in partnership with God. When God made man, put him in the earth, man became a partner with God to fulfill some things that he has designed for the earth. But the terminology that is used in 1 Corinthians 3.9 is interesting because it said you are God's husbandry. Even in chapter 15 of John, Jesus said, I am the vine my father is the husbandman, and you are the branches. So all of this is agricultural terminology. My title today is Back to Ground Zero. Some few years ago when the Twin Towers in New York uh, were exploded and uh, collapsed, they began a process of cleaning up the debris. It took them months and months to do so. And, and when they got finished, they said, we are going to build a new building as a testimony of, of the resilience of the American people to survive such a, a thing. Uh, and we're going to build it at ground zero. Ground zero was the place where the, the uh, uh, explosion took place. And uh, so ground zero was where the thing started from. And, and when we say ground zero, we're talking about going back to where something started or where something happened. And that is my purpose here in my title, Back to Ground Zero. God's calling us agricultural in his terminology where we're concerned. So we're going back to ground zero. 
God planted, one of the first things that God did was plant a garden on the east side of Eden. God harvested Adam from the ground. He was not born except from the womb of the earth. Adam's assignment was, assignment was husbandry. He was to take care of that garden. All of creation was commanded to be fruitful. God plants nations and kingdoms, Jeremiah 18 and 9. God planted the heavens, Isaiah 51, 6. The kingdom of God is like a planted mustard seed. Matthew 13, 3. He said, if you've got faith, it's a grain of mustard seed. He says that in one place, but then in another place, he says the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. And what happens? It's the smallest of all seeds. And when you plant it, it grows. Where do you plant it? In the ground. It grows and becomes a mustard tree, and the birds come and nest in it. So he's not saying if you've got the smallest amount of faith, you can move mountains. What he's saying is God hath dealt unto every man the measure of faith. Plant it. Plant it right here. Plant it in God and let it become a faith tree, not a faith seed. And then you can help yourself and others. Uh, agriculture. God is glorified when we bear much fruit. John 15 and 8. The word of God is an incorruptible seed. 1 Peter 1 23. The Holy Ghost bears fruit. Nine fruit. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance. You know, you know the deal. You know the deal. Who said, who said that? Joe Biden. Oh, yeah. When he got to the place, he couldn't <coughs> say anything. You know, you know, you the, know thing, the deal. The thing. <laughs> you know the thing. <laughs> Men's lives are likened unto trees. All through the Bible, Jesus talks about men's lives being like trees. Matthew 7. By their fruits you shall know them. And he's talking about spirits. Try the spirit. By their fruits. You shall know that all of these are agricultural terms. Uh, in Luke chapter 1 in verse 42, the Bible talks about the fruit of the womb. Hebrews 13, 15 talks about the fruit of the lips. All of these things are talking about sowing and reaping. That is agricultural. Uh, in Daniel chapter 2, I want you to turn there with me. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 31, starting there. Old King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, had a dream. Not because he was a good man, but because God decided that he wanted to do something. And he gave this man a dream. Since he was asleep, he could not object. You've heard me say that before. So he had this dream, and he woke up, and this dream troubled him. And he went to all of his soothsayers and magicians in that uh, kingdom and told them, I want you to tell me what I dreamed, and I want you to tell me what it means. Well, they couldn't, obviously. And so he was going to have them all killed. Well, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, and Ezekiel, and some others were all prisoners of war captured from Israel and were living in Babylon. Well, Daniel went to his compatriots and asked them to pray with him that uh, he was under threat of being uh, exterminated and asked God to give him the, the interpretation of the dream. Now, first of all, he didn't know what the dream was, and the king wouldn't tell him. He just thought if they could find out what it meant, they could also find out what it was. That's a pretty tough taskmaster right there. But anyway, I'm going to take up reading where this, uh, it, where the, uh, it takes up here in verse 31 of Daniel chapter 2. Thou, O king, sawest, and behold, a great image. This great...
great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. That means magnificent. The image's head was of fine gold, the breast and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet of iron, part of iron and part of clay. Thou sawest till that till a stone was cut out without hands, which smote the image upon the feet that were of iron and clay, and brake them to pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold, all broken to pieces, and became like the chaff of the summer threshing floors, and the wind carried them away that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This is the dream, and we will tell thee the interpretation thereof before the king. Now, we'll stop reading there to say that God gave this revelation to Daniel so that he would know not only what the interpretation was, but he would know what the dream was to begin with. And uh, this convinced the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, that Daniel was the real deal. And it put Daniel in a place of importance in that kingdom. As a matter of fact, in years to come, this was... Babylon, it was the uh, uh, Assyrian Babylonian uh, uh, dynasty. And in years, years, years to come, way down the road, there were wise men called Magi that came from the east. And they followed a star. And it took them to Bethlehem where they knew that the king of the Jews was to be born. Daniel taught them that because this is where they were from. Daniel taught them things about the heavens and about the signs and about God and the kingdom of God. And those magi came and blessed Mary, Joseph, and the baby years later with a huge caravan of offering of goods and supplies and of wealth that Joseph and Mary lived on down in Egypt, where they fled because Herod was trying to kill the babies. And they were there for a while, and now all of that sustained them, and then they were able to go back home. So this kingdom that Daniel was in, this gave him position to teach these mag magicians and soothsayers, their wise men, things that were coming in the future. And at this point, hundreds of years earlier, God was making provision for the supply of the Christ child. Isn't that interesting? God plans ahead. You can't cut God off at the past. He's already made provision. So, now, understanding this, go over to verse 44 with me. Or, or rather, uh, look at verse 41. Whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes, part of potter's clay, part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it of the strength of the iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with the miry clay. We go on down to verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom, which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, no human involvement, and that it break in pieces the iron, the brass, the clay, the silver, the gold, the great God hath made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter, and the dream is certain, and the interpretation is sure. Now, 
I want you to examine a few things with me. There were four kingdoms in this statue. A lot of people think there were more, but you've got the you got the the head and the shoulders. Uh, you've got the uh, uh, which was Babylon. You've got the uh, breastplate and the arms, which were silver, and that was the kingdom that defeated Babylon, which was the Medo-Persians, Media and Persia. And uh, then you got the belly and the thighs of brass, and that was the Greco-Roman, uh, I mean the Greco-Macedonian kingdom. The, it was actually Greece. Uh, then you got the legs of iron. That was the great Roman Empire. It was divided into an eastern and a western division. That's where the two legs come from. But then you got the ten toes of the feet of those two legs. And a lot of people think that's another kingdom, but it's not. It's a continuation of the Roman kingdom. Rome ruled the entire known world at that time. Mm -hmm. And the, the feet represent the revised or revived Roman Empire in, in later years to come. As a matter of fact, it is still present in the European area right now, and it's playing into our history even as we sit here and speak. So I want you to see with me that this prophecy was for then and then down through the years even to the latter days. You know, Daniel ends his book by God saying to him, I've told you all these things, but it's not for now. So seal up the book and close it off, and it, it will be revealed at a later time. Oh. Now, there are things going on in the world today that are a part of this vision. I want you to notice that there were four kingdoms, and they were destroyed by a fifth kingdom which was that little stone cut out of the mountain without hands and it crushed all the other kingdoms and grew into a mountain that filled the whole earth. You might call it Mount Zion. The mountain of the Lord. Now, I want you to see this. This image was standing on the ground and it was barefooted. Otherwise, you wouldn't be talking about his toes. Hello. <laughs> Remember, we're talking about back to ground zero. Mm -hmm. It took me some real deep study this week to understand some of these things that I'm giving to you for free. <laughs> You don't have to sweat over it like I did this week. Now, here's the thing. The European Union common market is even now metamorphosizing. Mm -hmm. You've heard of Brexit. That's people that are leaving and doing something different. And it may not be the European Union. Union. It might be some other form in that part of the world. Some, some things are being formed right now with Russia and India and places like that that may become part of this equation. I'm not really interested in who it is because they're going to get crushed no matter who it is. We already know this. But the European Union uh, is, is basically Italy is where Rome is. It's where the papal authorities are in Rome. Uh, France, England, Belgium, Greece, Portugal, Germany, Australia, um, not Australia, Austria, Spain, and Holland, or the Netherlands, same thing. It's ten, and uh, there's ten toes. Okay. Now, There is a conglomeration right now working with uh, China, 
Russia, India, Indonesia, Brazil, Mexico, Iran, and Turkey that are coming at, that are forming a financial union. So I don't know if that's going to play into it or not. I really don't care, to be honest with you. I'm just telling you that God was aware of these things, but I want you to notice that this barefooted image was smote in the feet and it began to crumble and it crumbled from the ground up. All the way to the top. It's kept it was sort of like the Twin Towers. Just caved in on itself. And just uh, the wind blew it away. That's how important world kingdoms are. But all of these were world kingdoms. All of this was about the kingdoms. Remember, Jesus said one of the signs of the end times is nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light are at war. It's not as obvious as a lot of people would need for it to be to see it. But those of us who are a part of the kingdom of God, we see it. And we understand it. Now then, okay. Let me tell you something about the number five. It was five kingdoms. When Israel marched out of Egyptian bondage, years after this, the Bible says they marched out harnessed, H-A-R-N-E-S-S-E-D, harnessed. That word you would think would be like a harness you put on a horse, but that's not what that word means in the Hebrew. It means in ranks of five. Ranks of five. They marched out in ranks of five. Why? Because God told them that's what to do. They marched out in order, not in chaos, in order in ranks of five. Now, here's an interesting thing. This little stone that smote the image, this giant image, what did David smite that giant with, with that he was facing? Stones. Little stones. Amen. Where do you think he got that notion from? He had become proficient with a sling because he understood the power of a small stone. Now, The word M-A-H is the fifth letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And as you know, all the characters in the Hebrew alphabet carry not only a, a letter, but a, a numerical value. And the number of the, fi of the, of the fifth uh, letter of the alphabet, five, may... Uh, means harnessed, and it, and it also means that when Israel marched out of Egyptian bondage in ranks of five, that it left such a scar on the Egyptian society that they, from that day to this day, hate the number five. It's interesting that it was the number five that brought down these kingdoms. As a matter of fact, even today on an Egyptian clock, where the five is out beside it is a very small zero that represents an eye. Why? Because they view the number five as evil. They view it, they look at it as an evil number. Why? Because it left a bad taste in their mouth, the, the defeat that they suffered at the hands of God's ranks of five that overrode the great Egyptian power. I want to say to you that God... He, he, he just, he's never threatened by anybody or anything. 
no matter how big and bad it may look or seem, it's nothing to God. It's like a flea you flick. And so God is almost toying with evil. He's fiving them. <laughs> you got five fingers on that hand that make a fist. <laughs> Amen. Okay. So I want I wanted to throw that at you just to sort of lay a little groundwork because I'm going somewhere with this. Turn with me in your Bible to the book of Revelation. Revelation chapter eleven. Revelation chapter eleven. Verse 15 and uh, 16. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God. Now the four and twenty elders represent the Old Testament heads of the twelve families of Israel. And the New Testament twelve apostles of God's church. So you get the the span from the old to the new, and you see that there are 24 elders in the book of Revelation. They all, and in another place it says, they cast their crowns before him and fall down and worship him. But you must understand with me that it was the seventh angel that sounded. Seven is the number of fulfillment and completion and finality and maturity, and fullness. It was that seventh angel that sounded, and uh, that the word that went up at the sounding of the seventh angel was the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. Isn't that what happened in that image there? All the other kingdoms came to nothing, and God's kingdom grew. So it's a theme here. And, and I, I want you to see that it says, He shall reign forever and ever. Now then, have you ever heard those words before in, a, in a, something that you might remember? Prayer. Hail's huh? Messiah. Prayer. Huh? The hallelujah, the hallelujah chorus. Handel's Messiah. And he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's about Revelations chapter 11. That's what Handel wrote that whole uh, movement about. It was, uh, it, and the hallelujah chorus is the apex of what these elders are doing, falling down and crying out to, uh, praises and glory and honor to God. Revelation chapter 19 and verse 16 says this, And he, Jesus, hath on his vesture a name written, King of kings, and Lord of lords. Now he's not just king and lord. He is king over other kings and lord over other lords. Revelations 5 and 10. And he hath made us, say us, us. unto our God kings and priests and we shall reign on the earth. Now, everybody wants to go to heaven. But this says, we shall reign on the earth. Even if you go to heaven, you can.
coming back. Because the earth was made for man. Thank you. John in the book of Revelation says, And I saw the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city, coming down, down, down from God, out of heaven. Where's it coming to? Here. As a bride adorned for her husband. Now, who's getting married? Who's the bridegroom? Who's the bride? The church is, is, is the bride, and Jesus is the bridegroom. He's coming here. He is the last Adam. The first Adam was made and put right here. As a matter of fact, he was made from here. Jesus is the prototype of the fulfillment of Adam. Okay. Now, let's go on a little bit. Turn with me to Psalms chapter 130. Actually, it's chapter 133. I want you to see how God gives us revelation and information and expects us to be able to seek the Spirit on where to put the pieces in the puzzle. In Revela uh, uh, Psalm chapter 133, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious ointment upon the head that ran down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, that went down to the skirts of his garments. As the dew of Hermon and as the dew that descended upon the mountains of Zion, for there the Lord commanded the blessing, even life forever. Now, we're given here a visual. Behold, it said. Look, see this. See Aaron as six quarts. Six quarts of anointed oil with spices mixed in it. Six quarts. And it wasn't just a little dab will do you. That's real cream. <laughs> it was poured upon his head. And this describes that it was running down and soaking his beard and soaking his garment all the way down to the hem of his garment. Now, Think with me. The anointing starts at the head, but it goes all the way to the feet. Six quarts going to puddle at the feet. The feet actually get more volume of anointing oil than the head does. It passes by the head and puddles at the feet. I want you to understand with me that this image that was explained by Daniel was from head to toe. This image that we see of Aaron is describing head to toe. We see Jesus in the book of Revelations, his head all the way to his toe. We are told in the New Testament that he is the head and the church is the body. The hands and the feet. You got to see as time progresses, we're coming to the last days. And just as you saw the latter kingdoms, the toes in this latter kingdom, I want you to see that the body of Christ is coming to the end days and we are the feet generation. Amen. Do you see that? Mm -hmm. We should have a saturating anointing that comes from the head. And that anointing flows down. Where did the Holy Spirit come from? Down. 
He is the anointed. Yes. He is the anointed. Now, <clears throat> John the Baptist revered the feet of Jesus. I am not worthy to carry his shoes. I am not worthy to unloose his shoes. Why did John have an understanding of the importance of the feet of the body? I think it was revelatory. I think he understood something. Mary and Martha and Lazarus were a family that lived in Bethany. In your Bible, you have more than one occasion where a woman stood behind Jesus at his feet because he was reclining at the table. Now, in, e in the east, you don't have a high table like you got here. It's low to the ground, and you sit on the floor or on the ground, and you have pillows, and you <coughs> recline. It's like you just lay at the table. And Jesus, what the Bible says, he was reclining at the table. Now, you've got two or three occasions. Well, actually, you've got four or five occasions. And we're not told all of the names of the people in these situations. But we know that Mary of Bethany, the sister of Martha and Lazarus, was at least two, and I'm figuring she might have been all five of them. Somebody says, well, it's Mary Magdalene because... Many sins have been forgiven. I'm not sure that Mary of Bethany wasn't Mary Magdalene. Quite frankly, I'm not sure she was. She may, she may not have been. She may have been. I, those things I don't need to figure out anyway. But I do know that she stood behind him at his feet. And on, on one occasion, she bent down. And with her tears, she washed his feet and dried them with her hair. And the Bible says she continually was kissing his feet. What made this woman revere the feet of Jesus? There was another occasion where an alabaster box of ointment was broken, and Jesus was anointed. But I want you to notice, if you go to the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, Jesus was teaching there one day. Martha comes in and says to Jesus, make Mary come back here and help me. I'm trying to serve all of the guests. Jesus said, Mary hath chosen the good part, and it will not be taken. Martha could have just come and sat down too, because it wasn't about the food. It was about the word. And where was Mary? She was sitting like the song says, at the feet of Jesus. Which was a sign of reverence and respect and of understanding who he was. you got to say, feet. It's the feet that touched him. Why was Joshua, why was Moses told, take your shoes off? on holy ground. When God made the ground, it was all holy. Because He made it. He made it. God don't make unholy things. It was all holy. It didn't get cursed until man sinned. And later on, for Noah, God lifted the curse then. Now, the last, one of the last things Jesus did was put a towel around his waist and while his disciples were at the last supper table 
He went around and washed their feet. Why? Why? It was a common courtesy back in those days because everybody was either barefooted or wore sandals and the roads were dusty and everybody pretty much walked wherever they went. And it was a common custom in that part of the world when a guest came, you would anoint them with oil and you would provide, at least provide for them to be able to wash their feet and refresh themselves or you would do it for them. But Jesus specifically took water and a towel and he washed the disciples' feet. He was giving us a message, y'all. He knew that they were the beginning of the feet generation. They were the beginning of the last days. And we've been in the last days for 2,000 years. And it is that generation that's going to be a part of the stone that crushes the other kingdoms. Bring that into today. You're going to see some things. You're going to see some things. Supernaturally, God is at work. Now, the first miracle after Pentecost was James, or Peter and John going to the tabernacle, or going to the temple, and a lame, lame, not blind, not deaf, lame man sat there, been lame from birth. Peter says, look on us. Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I unto thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he pulled him to, to his feet. And the Bible says, and immediately his feet were healed. The first miracle after the Holy Ghost came, the feet were healed. God's trying to shout things to us, but we're so busy being religious we don't see them. Now listen, when you see Jesus, in Revelations, you're not seeing the same Jesus that hung on the cross. There are no scars mentioned. The Bible says that John saw him, his head was white like wool, his countenance was like the noonday sun, his eyes were like a flame of fire, he, his, his garment shined and shimmered, and all the way down to his feet, and his feet were like burnished brass as if they had burned in a furnace. Ain't no snake bite going to hurt them feet. <laughs> That's right. God's shouting a message to us that the feet generation of the body of Christ is not going to have to endure the foolishness of the serpent's bite because we are going to tread him under our feet. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Isaiah 60, 13 says, And I will make the place of my feet glorious. It's in your Bible. I didn't write it. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. Now ye are the body of Christ. And time has rolled on. Peter and James and John had their day. Moses had his day. Abraham and Noah had their day. But we're coming to the end of days. Amen. We're coming to the feet of this image. And I want to say to you that this generation is a part of dealing with the kingdoms and establishing God's kingdom like He wanted it done in the garden. Back to ground zero. The garden. Adam was 
made barefooted. He was a barefooted king on the ground that he was made from. Think about that a minute. He was connected to the earth. He was not a heavenly being. Only a part of him was heavenly. And a part of him was earth. He was made for the power of heaven to rest in the earth. Holy ground. Psalm 24, 1. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. And the world and they that dwell therein. Now, let me delineate here to you that this scripture says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness of the earth is the Lord's. Then he starts talking about the world. See, the earth and the world are two different things. The earth is that which God made and the world are the systems that have been put in place that are now ruling the earth. And that's not of God. It's not God's kingdom that rules the earth. It's Satan's kingdom. It's the world system. So the earth is one thing, but the world is something different. Now listen, read it again. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. The world 